All right. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Kate Haynes. I'm a director with the Office of the Superintendent of Professional Governance, and uh, my colleague is here as well. Good morning, uh, Rebecca Friedman. I'm also a director with the office. So <clears throat> we have been uh, conducting uh, substantial engagement since uh, January, just uh, just before the Professional Governance Act came into force. And uh, we've developed this presentation to address a new number of audiences, uh, both industry, registrants, um, ministry staff, local governments, uh, Indigenous nations. Uh, hopefully, um, wherever you're coming from, there's something in here for you. <clears throat> uh, despite the fact that we don't have a live audience today, uh, I think you'll see that uh, we've worked really hard to incorporate sort of the feedback and questions we've received over the past few months to uh, make this as uh, proactive as possible in, in covering any questions you might have. And, and we have actually popped in specifically a few sort of mock question and answer periods that uh, uh, where you'll see some of the, the questions that were frequently asked. So uh, without further ado, uh, carry on. So today we're going to start with an overview of professional governance uh, as it relates to our office and uh, the natural resources and built environments in British Columbia. Uh, then we'll dig a bit further into <clears throat> the regulatory framework of the PGA itself, including a discussion of practice rights. And we're going to um, dive into a discussion of um, two new things that have been introduced with uh, the, the Professional Governance Act coming into force, which are a statutory, statutory duty to report, as well as uh, a requirement for firms to uh, register as registrants. Finally, we'll, we'll close with a discussion of um, our planned operations for our next year and a discussion of our standards of good regulation, uh, which which we'll be using to evaluate the performance of regulatory bodies under the PGA. <clears throat> so just so that everybody knows who we are and, and what uh, the Professional Governance Act is, um, both, uh, the, both the Office of the Superintendent of Professional Governance, or OSPG, as well as the Professional Governance Act, or PGA, were established in response to 2018's Professional Reliance Review. This was a uh, mandate commitment from, uh, for Minister Heyman from Ministry of Environment in the 2017 government. Uh, it was also a, conf uh, a, a requirement of the um, Confidence and Supply Agreement with the Green Caucus. And uh, Mark Haddock conducted a review of five regulatory body bodies and uh, came up with many recommendations in respect of professional reliance. So professional reliance is a model that uh, is commonly used in the natural resources sector in BC, where um, specific decisions will be assigned to a registered professional rather than a statutory decision maker within government. So the, we're relying on those professionals. Um, there were many recommendations about professional reliance in, in response to you know, specific um, uh, regulatory frameworks of, of different decisions being made, but, but two of the, the recommendations that came out of that review were actually focused on professional governance, and uh, those were the creation of the Professional Governance Act to create a common framework under which all of these regulated professions are operating and, and held accountable. And then secondly, the, the second recommendation was the office, the creation of our office as an oversight office for those regulatory bodies that administer the professions. So, you know, our, our role is not necessarily with respect to specific um, decisions being made in a professional reliance framework in a, in a given ministry or sector. But uh, when those ministries call on professionals to make those decisions in their frameworks, uh, our role is to ensure that they are show, those professionals are showing up, they're reliable, they're, uh, they're accountable to standards of professional and ethical conduct, and that uh, we, are, we can have confidence in those professionals. So just a little bit more about us, the Office of the Superintendent of Professional Governance. We're a very small office under the Ministry of Attorney General. We have a superintendent, uh, myself and Rebecca as directors, a number of um, 
policy policy analysts, and uh, we do get a fair amount of business operations support actually from Justice Services branch as well. Uh, the the positioning of us in uh, Ministry of Attorney General rather than any of the other uh, ministries that you know, administer professional reliance schemes is to create some separation between those ministries that use professional reliance and then an, an oversight body that is, is overseeing the professional regulators. So why is professional regulation important? Self-regulation is a privilege that is granted through legislation to protect the public interest and um, specifically um, where a given profession could have uh, an impact on the public interest. And when we think about, you know, civil engineering, for example, there's a, a very clear line of sight from, you know, the, the proper construction of buildings, um, you know, having a potential risk to human health and safety. And it's important for those professionals to be properly regulated in order that we have confidence in, in the integrity of those buildings. Um, but we also have uh, the context in the, the natural environment as well as, uh, you know, potential risk to the receiving environment. Uh, well, a good example of this is the incident that happened with the Mount Polly tailing storage facility uh, that would indicate an importance of um, pro professionals working in the natural resources sector as well as, as putting that public interest first. So when these regulated professionals uh, are, are part of one of these self-regulated professions, they now have an ethical and legal duty to put the interests of the public ahead of their own. Those uh, regulated professionals may also be granted specific exclusive rights to practice a certain discipline or use a certain title. And this helps the public understand the layperson who needs some um, uh, work done on their, you know, their um, forest stewardship plan or on a building being built, um, who they can access, who is qualified to practice in those areas and will be held to those um, standards of accountability. So which professions are under the Professional Governance Act? Uh, initially, when the Professional Governance Act was brought into force on February 5th, those uh, five regulatory bodies that were part of the Professional Reliance Review uh, are, are now under the PGA. So the Association of BC Forest Professionals, Applied Science Technologists and Technicians of BC, the BC Institute of Agrology, the College of Applied Biology, and Engineers and Geoscientists BC. Coming soon uh, will be the Architectural Institute of BC. They are, um, they have been for a number of years seeking amendments to their statute for, for modernizing the Architects Act. And what government actually did was make a decision that it, it made better sense for the, that profession to come under the PGA rather than make those legislative updates. So the, the Architects Act has already been transferred to our Ministry for Administration and probably in about the next year, the, the Institute will be coming on board officially uh, under the PGA. So just some, some key messages up front about what stays the same uh, and, and what's different under the PGA. Those five regulatory bodies will continue registering the same, regulating and registering the same professionals they did prior under their former statutes. And, and registrants such as professional engineers, professional foresters, uh, registered professional biologists, they will all continue to primarily act with their regulatory body. What's new is that uh, those regulatory bodies, uh, they're former, they've all formerly operated under individual statutes. They, those acts have all now been repealed and they are all now operating under the Professional Governance Act. So that now has a common, uh, a common operating for framework in terms of merit-based election processes for councillors, requirements for lay councillors, uh, standard, common standards of professional and ethical conduct as well as a common uh, system to address complaints and discipline of, of registrants. And then our office has this new oversight role to ensure that the regulatory bodies are operating in the public interest. And we'll talk a little bit later about the criteria that we'll be using to assess those regulatory bodies. Um, but I guess a key message is that uh, 
typically registrants will continue interacting with their regulatory bodies. OSPG will primarily interact with only the regulatory bodies. It will, it will not be common that the OSPG would be directly interacting with registrants. So this is a, a tip question we typically get at this point in the presentation, which are why are some professions under the PGA and not others? Uh, the PGA is uh, neutral as, uh, as to what professions could be contained under it. it there's nothing specific about the PGA um, that uh, applies only to the natural resources sector and built environment sector. But uh, the, the five regulatory bodies we have today uh, just really reflect the, the fact that they were part of that professional reliance review that was initiated in 2017. And uh, they are now the first to be under the PGA. Uh, you know, we already have the example of the architects coming on board. And the, uh, the, the PGA does provide for additional professions to be designated, new regulatory bodies to come under, uh, regulatory bodies to be amalgamated. Uh, and that's something that um, as, as we build our work in the future, we'll certainly be uh, looking as uh, where it makes sense to bring additional uh, professions under the PGA. So I'm going to talk now about uh, just the governance structure and framework of uh, under the PGA. So starting with the statute, the PGA uh, is enabling legislation. It provides authorities for the key uh, structures and functions of the regulatory bodies. So that includes uh, credentialing uh, new registrants and setting standards of um, conduct and, and competence and holding the registrants accountable through through uh, performance reviews and audits and then uh, carrying out any um, investigations and discipline um, in response to complaints as needed. Uh, the PGA also includes authorities for regulations to be set and I'll talk a little bit about the regulations that are following under the PGA in a moment. I just wanted to mention uh, well we have brought uh, most of the provisions of the PGA into force as of February 5th. Uh, there are a few provisions that relate to declarations that have not been brought into force. Uh, so the intent uh, with those declarations provisions was for registrants to um, file a declaration that they are competent to take on the work that they're engaged to, to do and that they are free of conflicts of interest with respect to that work. Um, for every job or project they were engaged on. And um, the intent behind that is, is solid, that we need more transparency to ensure that, uh, and, and accountability to ensure that registrants are in fact only uh, practicing in the areas they're competent to practice in and that they are avoiding uh, any real or perceived conflicts or addressing those conflicts as they come up appropriately. Um, but the mechanisms of having it, uh, filing for every um, time a, a registrant is engaged uh, was um, seen to be problematic and overly burdensome. There are other mechanisms within the PGA that also help to increase the transparency around a registrant's uh, competence and um, ensure that they are um, thinking about and avoiding uh, situations of conflicts of interest and we wanted to be able to see how those other provisions were playing out and evaluate their effectiveness before we uh, thought to bring in these other provisions. So we'll continue to look at uh, where declarations might be valuable and useful and um, look to cater the those requirements um, where they are needed and not uh, put them in place um, across the board. So regulations, um, as I mentioned, um, we have the ability to set regulations uh, in a number of different uh, areas. Uh, our philosophy has been to only put in place regulations at this time that are necessary for the PGA to function and where possible to put um, our expectations in place in a non-regulatory way. And that is through our guidance that we have set. 
so sitting under the sort of level of regulations is OSPG guidance. Um, and this guidance mostly speaks to our expectations for regulatory bodies to put in place uh, provisions in their bylaw level. Uh, all of our guidance is available on our website, so anyone is able to look at what are the expectations set by OSPG. And then uh, underneath that is the bylaws of the regulatory bodies. So the PGA uh, requires mandatory bylaws to be set by the regulatory bodies, as well as gives authority for other um, areas that can be set in bylaws uh, necessary for the functioning of the regulatory bodies. All of our regulatory bodies have worked quite hard over the past few years to produce a complete new set of bylaws that are in compliance with the PGA. Their bylaws needed to be uh, filed with the Ministry of Attorney General after um, a suitability check um, by the superintendent. And this has all taken place and the copies of the filed bylaws are available on our website as well as on the websites of the individual regulatory bodies. And then finally sitting under the bylaw level are all of the guidance and policies that uh, regulatory bodies produce that support the functioning of the bylaws and provide uh, greater detail. And uh, regulatory bodies are continuing to work to update the guidance that sits under their bylaws uh, so that it uh, all lines up. Go to the next slide. So the regulations that we've put in place, we've got a general regulation. Uh, this includes things like setting out the merit-based election process for uh, councillors, council election, as well as setting a mandatory oath of office that all uh, councillors must take, as well as chairs of committees. It includes the provisions uh, around firm regulation that enable uh, firm regulation for a particular regulatory body, as well as other administrative matters. Each regulatory body has its own professional regulation, which sets out the scope of their regulated practice, that is who they can regulate, as well as the reserved titles conferred upon the professions and reserved practices if they exist for each of the regulatory bodies. We also have a transitional regulation, uh, which addresses matters uh, related um, to sort of the immediate changes needed for uh, the council structures, as well as including consequential amendments to other regulations and statutes where they may have previously uh, referenced uh, a repealed statute and are now uh, referencing the Professional Governance Act. So now we're going to get into a bit more detail on practice rights under the Professional Governance Act. So practice rights is sort of what we use um, generally as uh, the public to um, speak to, like who can who can practice what profession. Um, under the PGA, though, there's actually no uh, no use of the term practice rights itself. There's actually three connected pieces that together make up those practice rights. And the first is uh, regulated practice, which is who each regulatory body can regulate. So for example, uh, engineers and geoscientists, BC can regulate engineers and geoscientists. Uh, the Association of Forest Professionals of BC can uh, regulate foresters. Uh, neither of them can regulate doctors because that's an entirely different um, regulatory body that, that has the regulated practice for doctors. So the the um, former statutes of, of the five regulatory bodies, they had uh, definitions of, of who they can regulate, and those were each drafted at different points in time in different drafting styles with different levels of detail. We did consider sort of copying and pasting those over and reestablishing them in the PGA word for word, but we felt there was a, a risk of unintended consequences if you had something framed one way for one profession and, and another way for a different profession, that you might accidentally, you know, leave out uh, an important area of, of regulated practice just um, because of the way you would interpret those two def definitions alongside each other. 
So what we did was uh, we looked we looked across those definitions and we drew out what was the common element that you know could be consistently articulated uh, between the different professions and and what we pulled out was this idea of. Uh, which which advice and services uh, based on what disciplines are registrants of that regulatory body providing? So in the case of uh, engineering, we have you know a list of engineering d disciplines that uh, engineers would be providing advice and services related to. In the context of professional forestry, we'd be talking about providing advice and services related to trees, forests, forest ecosystems, etc. So. Uh, I guess the key message there is uh, we worked very uh, diligently to ensure that that all those registrants reg re formerly uh, registered under the former statutes would be continued to be covered under the new definition and that all those registrants would would carry forward and be accountable to under the PGA. New words, um, but uh, in, in effect um, establishing the same thing. Second piece of practice rights is actually reserved title, which is not uh, mentioned on this slide specifically, but again, all those uh, regulatory bodies under the PGA, uh, under their former statutes, uh, did already have rights to confer titles on uh, specific in, on, on individuals. Uh, and then only those individuals registered with that regulatory body and granted uh, that, that registration status um, would be allowed to use those titles. So, uh, for example, professional engineer is a title reserved only for professional engineers registered with EGBC. Um, again, there, all five regulatory bodies had those reserved titles and they were mostly carried forward as is with, with a few modernizations and updates. But uh, it, the, the, the reserve titles under the PGA should be fairly familiar. Finally, the third piece of the puzzle on uh, practice rights is reserved practice, which are areas of practice that are reserved for registrants of a particular regulatory body only. So for example, in, in the health context, only uh, doctors registered with, uh, with that regulatory body can uh, do the practice of, of medicine and, and seeing patients. Uh, in, in the case of the PGA, there were, uh, there were three reserved practices established in former statutes which have been carried forward to the PGA. Uh, so those were reserved practices for engineering, geoscience, and um, uh, forestry. Uh, only registrants of, of regulatory bodies can do that work. And we had to do the same sort of uh, analysis of, of not creating unintended consequences with different formulations of definitions. And what we, what we landed on in this case was uh, those things within the regulated practice that require the experience and technical knowledge of the professional in those disciplines as it relates to the protective purposes of the PGA, which are of course um, public health and safety as well as um, harm, potential of harm to the environment. So uh, the sort of the, the overall message with this slide is, you know, we had to change the words um, under the PGA, but uh, we have reestablished basically the status quo in terms of regulated practice, reserve practice, reserve title, collectively practice rights uh, under the PGA because of um, the, the fact that we, we had to transition to a new framework. We had uh, some new words, but we're achieving the same thing. So these next couple of slides just uh, cover off um, uh, just what I what I explained explained previously with the diagram uh, just has the words to go along with it. So regulated practice reestablish the status quo with uh, the with some modernization. Ensure that all registrants are subject to regulation under the PGA and follow that formula of provision of advice and services based on disciplines in relation to specific matters. Uh, next slide uh, speaks to those pre existing reserved practices. So I mentioned uh, engineering, geoscience, and forestry were already reserved practices. Uh, we have reestablished them in the framework of the PGA and articulated them in a consistent modern format that uh, is based on re what requires the experience and technical knowledge of the professional in the context of the public interest purpose. Uh, 
So we recognize that those those definitions from the former statutes they were you know very long standing very familiar well understood um, by professionals working on the ground. Uh, there's there's a transition that is necessary to support uh, the you know the fact that we've we now have different words in in the regulation. So we will be working with uh, with the regulatory bodies to publish further supporting materials that illustrate the reserved practice. Uh, we we know that the regulatory bodies uh, do have this material already, but it isn't necessarily articulated in a way that's 100% clear to all the audiences, the the public, industry, government, statutory decision makers, etc. So so that will be something over time that we that, um, we in the regulatory bodies build up, and. Uh, also, we did we did include a backstop in the regulation itself that references you know every just for clarity uh, everything that was in that reserved practice definition in the former statute on the day it was repealed does continue to be in in the reserved practice going forward just so that everybody is 100% clear. So you might be wondering about those regulatory bodies that. Uh, did not previously have reserved practice under their former statutes. And the PGA does provide a route for establishing new reserved practices. And the legislature set out in, in the course of um, uh, bringing the PGA through the legislature that the, the Institute of Agrology, the College of Applied Biology and the Applied Science Technicians and Technologists are now eligible to seek reserve practice and have that, have that established. And this is most certainly consistent with that public interest purpose of the PGA. It would rec rec ensure that all practitioners in those professions are qualified, competent and accountable uh, by way of registration with a regulatory body under the PGA. Um, currently, for those professions, it is uh, entirely legal to practice those professions and not be registered. Uh, the, only, the only difference that you would have between an unregistered biologist and a registered biologist is that the, the registered biologist can hold themselves out as a registered professional biologist, while the unregistered biologist uh, could not use that specific title. They, are, um, they can legally engage in the same practice practice. So uh, the superintendent is supportive of exploring those reserved practices for those regulatory bodies, of course, subject to an appropriate process and engagement. The process is actually quite far down uh, the path already for applied biology and agrology. We expect that will come into force within the coming years. Uh, it may take some more time for ASTTBC. Uh, they are certainly interested in establishing a reserve practice, but uh, they're not quite on the same timeline as the other two. And just a note that those new reserve practices, as, as we saw on the original diagram uh, at the start of this section, um, the, the reserve practice is a subset of the regulated practice. So, uh, we we already have those regulated practice definitions for for CAB, uh, BCIA, and ASTTBC, and, and just a note that of course the the reserve pra the regulated practice for CAB and BCIA specifically excludes those areas of reserve practice already granted to other regulatory bodies under the PGA. So uh, the the establishment of any new reserve practice for those for those professions already necessarily excludes any potential overlap with a uh, with an existing profession under the PGA. So that's an important thing to note. Uh, all that said, um, as as we move forward, we we do expect those uh, reserve practice definitions for for the new reserve practices to be based on that modern consistent format. Uh, already set out for the existing reserve practices, the sort of required experience and technical knowledge. Uh, we are in the process of doing this further engagement and uh, will be uh, along with regulatory bodies and uh, it, that, that will continue prior to having definitions set out in, in the regulations. We do recognize, you know, the importance of supporting employers and, trans and professionals in, in the transition. So we'll be publishing the, you know, the intention and the timeline very early and uh, identifying pathways for, you know, those, those individuals who may have a lot of experience in a particular area of um, practice, but maybe not a traditional education or credentialing route, um, supporting uh, their, their continued practice of, 
of that profession through sort of alternate uh, registration pathways. And <clears throat> so you can you can also download these slides. Uh, they're they're also on our website, and this just this just gives you a, a snapshot of of how these definitions were actually constructed for engineering and forestry. So these are the actual words from from the regulations. So a couple questions that we commonly get uh, at the end of this section is uh, how will cross professional practices be addressed as new, pra new reserve practices are introduced? We certainly already have a good, uh, a good working model of, of a true overlap in reserve practice. And this example relates to um, forest roads and crossings. So both um, engineers and geoscientists, BC and AB, the Association of Professional Forest Professionals, of, eh, got that one wrong. Uh, they, they both have that within their reserved practice. Both uh, in, in, individuals seeking to have work done um, on a forest road or crossing could equally uh, retain either an engineer or a forester to do that work. It's in with um, there's a joint practices board between those two regulators who um, set common practice standards for for those um, those practices that are are common to the two professions. So. This provides assurance that, you know, no matter which professional is being retained to do that work, there is a, a common uh, standard of practice for, for how that work will be done. What we've actually found, though, is that um, those true overlaps are not nearly so common as um, what we might call intersections or alignments. So in the context of something like the riparian areas regulation, um, professionals from, from all five of the regulatory bodies are, also, are all authorized to um, work as qualified professionals uh, under that act or under the regulation. And um, they, they likely are not actually doing exactly the same thing. Uh, an applied biologist would be looking at that work and bringing different skills to the table um, than a professional forester would. They might be working alongside each other in a complementary way, contributing to different parts of the project, um, but, but neither of them is actually doing the exact same practice as the other, and, and you necessarily need the skills of, of both those professionals or even others to uh, complete the task at hand. So, so part of that, uh, that work and engagement that we're doing as, as we transition to those new reserve practices will be identifying those intersections and alignments and you know, explore whether there are truly any overlaps uh, that, that need to be addressed and, and articulated uh, with um, common practice standards, for example. And then another question we frequently get is, how, how exactly do I know what is reserved practice and what is not? So our, our understanding um, from, from our previous engagement is that it is well understood by um, practicing professionals uh, where the line is between what's reserved and, and what can be done by the non-professional. Um, but it is not necessarily clearly articulated uh, in, in accessible materials to other audiences. So that's uh, where I mentioned previously those illustrative materials that is important for uh, ourselves and regulatory bodies to produce that um, over time that resource will become available and commonly understood to a broader range of audiences as to what is exactly reserve practice and what is not. So that's the end of the regulatory framework section, and now I'll hand it over to Rebecca. Thank you. So to begin with um, talking about duty to report, this is not, not something that's new. In fact, um, an ethical obligation to uh, report uh, for a registrant to report where they are observing uh, misconduct or incompetent uh, practice from another registrant has always been contained in the code of ethics of the regulatory bodies. So that's not something new. What the professional reliance review um, unfolded was that it is 
an extremely important tool for regulatory bodies to be able to receive that information uh, so that they can look into the matters of the practice uh, of the particular individual and address um, their, the practice uh, concerns where necessary. Really important tool for regulatory bodies to be able to receive that information. Uh, because of that, and because of some additional sort of barriers that were recognized for registrants to be making those reports, um, the PGA now contains a statutory duty to report. And the difference between a statutory duty to report and ethical obligation, the statutory duty to report actually has um, some penalties that can be imposed on a, a, a registrant uh, for failure to meet their statutory duty. Um, the other uh, difference is that the statutory duty uh, applies to a registrant uh, reporting on any other registrant that is governed under the Professional Governance Act. So it's expanding the scenario uh, to uh, a registrant uh, being obligated to report on a registrant from another discipline. Now, uh, we understand that uh, professional uh, bio registered professional biologist is not going to be able to recognize and authoritatively uh, speak to sort of the technical practice of uh, an engineer, for example. Um, and, and that is not what uh, they're meant to do under this duty to report. However, um, under the PGA, all of our all of the registrants under all of the disciplines are subject to a common ethical and professional conduct requirements and standards. And that is something because of that commonality, um, it is uh, it is anticipated that reg registrants will be able to recognize unethical practice or practice that involves a conflict of interest, uh, regardless of the discipline, um, and be able to make a report and provide that information to the appropriate regulatory body so that they can assess the matter and take action as necessary. I also want to mention that this duty extends to employers or partners of registrants. So that um, an example would be in a case where a registrant's employment is terminated um, because of a concern about their practice um, as it relates to uh, a risk of significant harm to the environment or health and safety of the public. Uh, that employer is obligated to notify the registrant's regulatory body again so that the regulatory body can look into the matter and determine if they need to impose um, any additional um, provisions onto that registrant's practice. Um, so then I mentioned the significant harm to the environment or health and safety of the public or group of people is that that is the threshold uh, that would require reporting. So duty to report is not meant to capture um, all instances where uh, there are concerns about a profession's practice, but really the most significant and concerning ones. Um, in this case, it's going to require uh, an individual registrant to uh, assess the particular situation in which the registrant is practicing to determine if it in, is indeed um, a concern that would lead to a risk of significant harm. And uh, I also wanted to mention that um, the duty to report is centered around a registrant's practice because that is within the scope and mandate of a regulatory body to address. And so um, it is not meant to address concerns or risks of significant harm resulting from a government policy or authorization or activities happening on the land base. There are other avenues for someone to raise a concern about those policies or authorizations with the appropriate body that can take action. Um, and then there are reprisal protections included in the under the PGA. So anyone who is making a complaint to a regulatory body or who is fulfilling their duty to report are protected against reprisals. And should they be receiving any reprisals, 
then uh, there are avenues for them to uh, report that to the OSPG and for actions to be taken under the PGA. We do have some guidance out on our website that uh, helps build a common understanding of what the duty to report is and, and what are the uh, obligations of registrants and employers. So I encourage you to take a look at that guidance. Uh, we are also working with our regulatory bodies to come up with scenario based examples, um, illustrative examples that will help uh, registrants and employers to um, understand uh, what might uh, examples of, of triggers for the duty to report and those will will continue to develop those and and uh, distribute those uh, on an ongoing basis. So now switching to firm regulation, this is a new authority that has been included in the PGA that did not exist in the statutes of the regulatory bodies previously. It is in recognition that the culture and work environment of professionals um, supports and aligns with their professional and ethical practice. And um, so engineers and geoscientists BC have been given authority to start regulating engineering and geoscience firms beginning in July of 2021. Uh, and engineers and geoscientists BC are building on years of uh, foundational work uh, that they have laid in this area, including their voluntary organizational quality management program that they've been successfully running for several years. And um, essentially their program um, relates to a professional practice management plan that the firm uh, is required to put in place that basically outlines their policies and their programs that will support uh, ethics um, as well as continuing education and quality management aspects related to the practice of the professions. And um, so as EGBC is bringing out their program, our other regulatory bodies are observing and, and learning from EGBC's program and looking at considering how uh, they would roll out their own regulation of firm program, uh, but they have indicated that they are uh, two to five years away from being ready to regulate firms. Despite this, all of our regulatory bodies as well as OSPG are uh, working collaboratively now on what uh, it would look like to regulate uh, in a multidisciplinary firm scenario to ensure that uh, the, it is uh, an effective and and um, uh, a smooth uh, process for for all parties. So the regulation, uh, the definition of firm in the PGA is a very broad definition. It's pretty all encompassing. Uh, it includes entities that are providing services for internal consumption as well as uh, services uh, within the profession, regulated profession for external consumption. Uh, the one exception uh, is that the definition distinguishes uh, government registrants, uh, so ministry or agency of the provincial government, um, and these are excluded from the definition of firm, except in the case where they are prescribed as firms, or in what that means is that uh, government has made a decision to include a particular ministry or agency as a government registrant, and then they can be reg re regulated as firms by the regulatory body. So starting uh, with um, entities that uh, are engaged in providing engineering and geoscience services within government, um, we have had several of our um, ministries and entities that have been prescribed in an initial phase. So that includes the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, WorkSafe BC, Technical Safety BC, the Oil and Gas Commission, and forthcoming is BC Hydro. Uh, 
Uh, there are other ministries that are also uh, carrying out engineering and geoscience work, uh, some examples being energy mines and low carbon innovation, as well as Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. And work continues to um, engage with those ministries and uh, take the lessons learned from the initial implementation of the uh, ministries and entities listed above in order to inform uh, the rollout of firm regulation for these other entities. Now, EGBC uh, it, and firm regulation is, is a program of EGBC, and so your best resource is the information provided by EGBC. They have uh, delivered a webinar and a recording of that webinar is available online. That's a fantastic resource. Uh, and they are also um, able to connect directly with anyone uh, to discuss uh, matters of whether or not um, a particular uh, company would be considered a firm and required to be registered. So, uh, will firms with registrants in two or more regulatory bodies be required to register with each regulatory body? So that's really describing the situation of a multidisciplinary firm. And that is something that our regulatory bodies and our office are actively looking at. Um, it may be that uh, they would need to register with each regulatory body as each regulatory body would be responsible for overseeing the uh, practice of that firm that, that falls within the regulated practice of, of the particular profession. Um, but uh, I want to assure everyone that um, we are all considering what is uh, a um, effective and sort of low burden uh, method for, for that to take place. So my firm only provides advice and services internally, not to external clients. Do I still have to register with engineers and geoscience BC? Yes. So the definition of firms uh, is a very broad definition and it does uh, encompass the scenario where a firm is carrying out engineering and geoscience work for internal consumption. So yes. So it's the duty to report question. So how can a biologist report an engineer if the biologist has no engineering training? And I, I talked about this a bit uh, on the duty to report slide. Um, certainly there is no expectation that a biologist uh, would be able to uh, comment on the uh, technical aspects of an engineer's practice. However, uh, because a biologist and an engineer are now operating under very common uh, ethical and professional uh, practice standards, uh, there is certainly uh, some real um, scenarios where a biologist would recognize uh, ethical misconduct and professional misconduct of an engineer that would uh, could potentially lead to uh, a, a risk of significant harm and that biologist would then be obligated to make a report to engineers and geoscientists BC for them to look into the matter. When a regulatory body receives a report, uh, they, can, they treat it as a complaint and they do go through the same process they do with any complaints uh, where they assess the situation and then determine what action is needed. So um, once a registrant makes a complaint to the regulatory body, the onus is then on the regulatory body to do their due diligence and look into the matter. So regulatory bodies already had duty to report in their code of ethics. How is this duty to report different? And I hope I, I did answer that, but I can um, offer a few more uh, bit of summary pieces of information. Um, the duty to report in a code of ethics really speaks to uh, reporting on other registrants within the same discipline. The duty to report uh, statutory duty to report under the PGA is more uh, encompassing and 
would include a scenario where a registrant could be reporting on another registrant of a different discipline. As well, um, the statutory duty to report um, includes uh, some penalties if if a person is found to not be meeting their duty to report. Now, OSPG is not going to be out, out there looking to actively catch people uh, not reporting. How it would probably come up is that um, in a case of a complaint could be made that someone is not meeting their duty to report and that would have to be looked into. Or in the case of uh, an investigation uh, into a disciplined manner of a registrant it was determined that another registrant knew of the matter and didn't take action to report. That might be another scenario where uh, that that would come into play and um, an investigation would take place and appropriate um, uh, penalties or, or consequences would be would be laid. I'll just I'll add, just to, add to, I'll just add to add that to that. that, that um, uh, the statutory true duty to report actually has that uh, significant risk of harm uh, threshold in it, whereas the regulatory bodies um, in their own duty to, duties to report may, may require reports um, on, on issues that don't actually meet that threshold for the statutory duty to report. Okay, so our last topic today um, is to introduce our standards of good regulation, a little bit more about the role of OSPG. So um, we have put out a, a set of standards of good regulation. These are also available on our website. We have developed these based on the work of uh, the UK Professional Standards Authority. And uh, these set out um, OSPG expectations for regulatory body performance that would um, indicate that they are meeting their uh, public interest mandate. Uh, they are based on the functions of, of the regulatory bodies, so setting standards of competence and conduct, uh, setting education and continuing com competence requirements, the registration functions, the, the role uh, of regulatory bodies in carrying out audits and practice reviews, and their complaints and discipline system as well as a more uh, all-encompassing um, bucket related to uh, transparency and accountability in general. And uh, so OSPG will uh, be building out an audit and practice review program, which will be directed at the regulatory bodies and based on auditing or carrying out a practice review against these standards of good regulation. Uh, we intend that uh, we will be publishing the results of those uh, performance reviews on a regular basis. And um, this is a real um, important driver for the oversight role of our office, as well as uh, public uh, transparency and, and accountability for the regulatory bodies. And finally, just to tell you a little bit about what are some of the other functions of the office as we've moved from uh, away from implementing the Act to operating under the Act, uh, we will continue to set and update policies and regulations as needed. I talked a little bit about establishing our audit and investigation processes and our year one plan for, for initiating and, and beginning um, to carry out a performance review of the regulatory bodies. Kate had mentioned that we are bringing the Architectural Institute of BC under the PGA and the work uh, that we will be doing over the next year to support their transition. Uh, we also mentioned we have the ability to consider and recommend new designations. Um, there is a couple ways that um, those designations could happen. They could happen uh, by application of a professional body or the OSPG could carry out uh, an investigation on our own accord or it could be a decision of government, which was the case with the Architectural Institute of BC. All the information about 
uh, the designation process and the application process in particular, what information we'd like to see in an application, as well as what criteria we'll be using when we are assessing uh, whether or not to bring a regulatory body or a, a professional organization under the PGA. That is all available on our website for anyone who's interested in taking a look. Um, we also have set up uh, a professional governance advisory committee uh, that is made up of representatives from the ministries that both employ uh, professional registrants as well as rely on professional registrants and our regulatory bodies. So this table um, is uh, able to look at issues of uh, mutual interest to the ministries and the regulatory bodies and really constructive dialogue um, can take place at that table. Our office is uh, mandated to uh, conduct research, uh, evaluate our policies and guidance and share best practices. So we're really um, a, a function of our office is, is to be a center of excellence in professional governance and to help bring best practices from, from elsewhere into the uh, governance of professions in BC. And uh, we also communicate. So we have our OSPG website, which I've mentioned a few, a few times uh, as well. We are required to table an annual report to the legislature each year. And this year's annual report, which will be our second annual report, uh, will be tabled uh, in May, at the end of May. So I think uh, that is the end of our presentation. I think we have a contact slide. Yes. So uh, if anyone had any questions that uh, were not answered by us, and we encourage you to write them into our um, inbox and we will get back to you with your questions. And um, we want to thank you for <laughs> for uh, viewing this uh, webinar. We hope it has provided some useful information to you. And um, we look forward to uh, future conversations with folks um, as we uh, roll this out and continue our operations. So thank you so much.